everybody is on board. Thank you for spending a little portion of 7-Eleven day with us. And so without further ado, welcome to Parenting Hacks. Um, Parenting Hacks is an ongoing series of workshops in which we pair an expert with a parent and I am the parent. <laughs> I am not the expert. Um, I am a mother of five and my name is Maura Albritton and I work for the Exceptional Family Resource Center. And I have had in-home supportive services for two individuals in my household. And so I wanted desperately to partner with my friend, Mary Ellen Stives of the State Council on Developmental Disabilities um, to get a high quality, plain language um, presentation to the most people in order to reduce the real and I think the psychological kind of hurdles of applying for and accessing and receiving these kinds of services. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mary Ellen for an introduction. Thank you, Maura. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Mary Ellen Stives. I'm with the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, and we cover the San Diego and Imperial County area. In my past life, before I joined the council, I uh, worked at an independent living and supportive living program. So I encouraged and had the opportunity of supporting people and obtaining in-home support services for many, many years. And you know, that's why it's so important to really get this information to you know help people understand that this is a service available to you. This is one of those generic services that you will often hear used by the regional center and others. So by generic, it means it's available to you. So use it. So we'll just get going. What we're going to cover tonight, if you wanna, oh, there we go, Maura, thank you. The learning objectives, to recognize the intended purpose of in-home support services, to understand the intake and eligibility process, to know how to meaningfully participate in the IHSS assessment and determination. And we'll get into that in that slide in more depth. Identify the responsibilities of the recipient or the authorized representative, and to be aware of the options for resolving disagreements. So what is IHSS or in-home support services? So the types of services which can be authorized through IHSS are many. House cleaning is one, meal preparation, laundry, grocery shopping, personal care services, uh, and per personal care services would be bowel and bladder care, bathing, grooming, and paramedical services, accompaniment to medical appointments, and protective supervision. So basically, the in-home support services are intended to allow the person receiving those services to remain in their home of their choosing as opposed to an out-of-home facility and to help people remain safe in the community. So a child may receive in-home support services when they have a disability and are low income. By low income, I mean receiving SSI. That's an automatic eligibility criteria. If your income is too high for SSI, you may still get IHSS, but you might have to pay a share of cost. If parents are out of the house working, going to school or training, if parents are unable to provide care due to disability or illness, and if parents are sleeping or caring for other family members, and we don't have to tell you how daunting it is sometimes to get all the business you need taken care of when it's you doing the caring for everyone. So for a child to receive IHSS, they must physically reside in the United States, be a California resident, have a Medi-Cal eligibility determination, and live at home or in a boat of your choosing, whether that be an acute care hospital, long-term care facility, or, wait, excuse me, by of your choosing for an adult. And I see we have an adult with us here tonight who might actually be a recipient of IHSS. An abode of his choosing, he might not live in his parental home, but he lives in his own apartment. So it's not an acute care hospital. It's not a long-term care facility or a licensed community care facility since they provide those services. 
So you have to submit a completed healthcare certification form. And I'm going to pop in just with a quick little side note for any family members that might be here tonight who are maybe newer to the regional center, um, maybe their family member is a, is a recent, has been recently identified or is a newer client. Um, and if you do not have Medi-Cal already, um, I do want to just mention that there is a process with the regional center in which you can be, um, your your loved one might be made eligible for institutional deeming, that's the old fashioned word, um, for receiving a home community-based services waiver. And so there is a link on our resource slide. I just wanted to kind of plant that seed um, that if you're not Medi-Cal eligible right now, there, there might be another path um, that excludes means testing for the individual um, who is a regional center consumer. Thank you, Maura. That's really important information. So if you live in San Diego County, here's the application. I don't know, did you wanna go through the application, Maura? Just for people to view it. Well, we can save that until the end if people wanna go back and see it. You call this number, the 800 number, and then you complete the application with call center staff. Then you email or fax it, you can mail it in person. Here's all the addresses. So you'll all be getting a copy of this PowerPoint. So you'll have this information. If you live in Imperial County, same application, but you go through aging and disability services. And these are good um, little contacts, IHSS contact us type of messages. And try to document when you make the application, who you speak to, anything unusual or meaningful that happens during that phone call, it's always good to just keep a record of when you reached out because time is of the essence. You want to get that application submitted as soon as possible and get the in-person evaluation done. So Maura, take it Here away. Here I am, <laughs> lurking. Um, so we are at the point where your application's been processed, you finally are gonna be scheduled for an intake interview or visit. Um, often you will get a letter in the mail telling you, this is the date we will be at your house. Um, so just kind of as we would say for anything to do with social security office, if you get something <laughs> from aging and independence or from the County of San Diego, I encourage you to not let it sit in your pile of unopened mail, but rather open it and make sure that you are on top of, um, your correspondence with in-home supportive services because they will um, let you know and if you do have a problem with the time that they've given you you can certainly call and they they explain how to change your appointment but just a little tip from someone who's been there and might have opened it at the last minute um, so the ihss worker will conduct an interview it is not short it is not like a five or ten minute experience. It's a little bit more protracted, particularly that um, first one, but also for um, some redeterminations. And their purpose is to really assess how much help the person who is applying for IHSS services requires. And for minors, the amount of assistance is going, so minors for anyone under the age of 18, the age of majority, the amount of assistance is going to be compared to the amount of assistance that a same aged person without a disability would require. And they have all sorts of, like they have it down to the second of how long it should take a person who's this old to accomplish a particular task. So um, a couple things that I like to mention is that they will make the appointment. They will talk about the medical condition, the living arrangements. They will talk about any help that you are already getting as a person from your family, your friends, and others. The IHSS worker will also talk to you about IHSS services and then the particular services that you need. They will talk about how often you need the services. And so this is really, if you're a family member or if you are a person who is advocating for himself or herself, it is really important that you take a few minutes before that appointment 
with the IHSS uh, caseworker in order to really think through these are the services and this is really how it is for me to try to perform them or for my loved one to perform those services. It's important to be completely honest and forthright, candid, transparent, all of those words. Like this is not a time to try to be like, I can do everything. It's not a day to talk about the very best day ever, but rather what is the average day look like? What is it really like um, for your loved one? So it's really important to have some details to be able to talk like, like in really excruciating detail sometimes about what might not be obvious to someone who's just meeting your loved one for a few minutes, um, maybe on a good day. <laughs> and um, it's really important to talk about what's occurring real time at the time of that um, home visit. So I would recommend, and I'm sure Mary Ellen will nod, <laughs> that you have documentation, that you have contemporaneous, contemporaneous records, so real time kind of documentation, photos, videos, all of those things that kind of bring to life what it might look like. Um, and this will become particularly important um, for some, uh, some individuals who might be asking for or requesting protective supervision for their loved one. Um, when we get to the resources pages, you're going to hear me say that over and over, when we get to resources, please know that lots of information is linked from that page. We realize that children are not independent creatures, even children without disabilities um, do need supervision and assistance. So again, the younger a child is, perhaps the less services IHSS will think they require for certain things. But again, every single issue needs to be considered individually um, based on the information you provide in an interview. You'll see on the slide, I put um, as one of my like sort of talking points that the IHSS worker may ask to view the bedroom, the living area, the bathroom of the individual applying for IHSS. Now, when I put that on there, I thought, oh, everybody's gonna be like, oh, <laughs> everybody who enters my house for IHSS is a mandated reporter um, in terms of um, welfare, protection, et cetera. However, please know that they are really, I, I've had plenty of people in my house who've asked to go and look at my loved one's rooms and what's, I don't feel like they're there to do a gotcha, um, I, but I have had on a couple of occasions, someone say, hey, did you know they have this particular kind of handle that you might wanna look into? Or I saw this really neat, you know, like bed alarm for, you know, like, and gave me a very specific recommendation. So just, you know, being open, but, but I will admit, I, I do tend to like do a quick clean <laughs> so before people traipse through um, my house. So here we are. You're getting the full parent view. So other information. Oh, go ahead, Mary Ellen. More, just a quick thing. I, and I should have done a poll at the beginning. I'm not sure if anyone here is an adult with a disability who's going to be applying for IHSS or would like to, or you're the parent of an adult sibling or child who you think would benefit from in-home support services. As Maura mentioned, um, you know, we're a very strength-based world. We go to school, we wanna talk about all the great things our kids do. And that's important to do, except in this situation, you don't have to make things up, just be honest. And that's very difficult sometimes for an adult with a disability because it's sometimes very embarrassing to say, I don't really know how to make a meal. You know, when asked, do you cook your own dinner? Oh yeah, I've had people say, sure. And the worker does not know, you know, the next question should be, tell me about what your dinner looks like because a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, a dinner does not make. So, you know, just to gently let someone know you're available if they would like, to you to join them at their um, assessment, because having that outside input sometimes really can allow the person to get the amount of support they need, because it's, um, it's tricky, you know, people, none of us want to say what we can't do, and that's kind of the direction you've got to go in when you're applying for services. 
So um, anyway, just honesty is the best policy. Sorry, Maura. No, I appreciate that. And I, I, that's one of the best parts of parenting hacks is that we have kind of those different um, perspectives and I'm definitely coming at it from a parent perspective and I appreciate um, you helping to, to kind of present all of the viewpoints. Um, so under the question of what other information might you need to supply to the in-home supportive service folks, um, absolutely a healthcare professional is going to need to complete a certification on your behalf. And this is just to testify to your, your or your loved one's medical condition and that you will need some help. Um, typically, you're going to be asked to provide um, some information and I and I just want to be really clear this talks about like kind of in that initial application period but everything else is going to happen every single year um, for the duration of the time that the individual is receiving IHSS and wants to have IHSS services so if your loved one's condition is expected to be permanent and paramedical services are not being requested, then the certification form usually stands, but everything else you're gonna do over and over and it'll just become kind of something that you, you know is coming when you hear from IHSS, it's our annual visit, you know it's, um, these are the things you'll need to gather up. So typically you'll talk about your medical providers, how often you need to go to an appointment with them, their contact information, and often they want to know when the last time you saw that provider is. You may be asked to complete a form that lists all of your medications and when those refills are due. You may have, if you're doing protective supervision, um, you will need to complete what's called a 24-7 care plan, and I'll talk about that in detail in a few slides. And if you will be a recipient's representative, there's often even more forms that you will be requested to sign that will acknowledge your understanding and agreement to accurately and honestly utilize in-home supportive services. And if you are the recipient, you will sign those same kinds of forms. Okay. Um, I think we have the next slide. Mary Ellen, did I miss anything on that one? Nope. Okay. <laughs> um, so. Is there a share of cost for IHSS services? Question, anyone? Um, the answer is, depends. Um, a specialist in eligibility can determine if there are costs associated, if any, um, that you could be required to pay for the services you receive. Um, I will say that it's helpful to kind of think of share of cost um, or SOC, as the IHSS website will call it, as the equivalent of an insurance deductible. But unless your loved one has owns assets, this is usually not an issue, but I, it's not a blanket statement. It, it is really individually determined. Okay, but I will say, given that I think a lot of parents are here tonight, typically little kids don't have a lot of assets, and so that tends not to be an issue, but again, it's something to ask. Okay. And what services is an IHSS provider authorized to do? So when the person is approved for in-home supportive services, there will have been a determination. You will receive this very long piece of paper with lots of writing and boxes. I was, I meant to have it handy to hold up. Um, and this document is the guide to what you're allowed to accept, what you hire for, what you report on, like everything is tied to that document. Um, and it is a provider notification. There's one given to the recipient. There's one given to any of the providers linked to that recipient. And it really spells out like, this is how many minutes you can spend on these different tasks. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide because it talks about all, whoopsie, all the services that an IHSS provider is authorized to do. And again, the word authorized is really important. Um, Mary Ellen and I are here to, you know, we want people to be able to access those services that they need to live safely in their, the home of their choice. Um, and so it's really important that everybody kind of 
you know, honors the rules, if you will. So some combination of the following services are how the county will establish the number of service hours a person is allowed to receive. And so I, for the purposes of accessibility, I am gonna read the slide <laughs> just because. Um, and so those services are domestic services, meal cleanup, shopping for food, meal preparation, laundry, other shopping and errands, respiration assistance, feeding, dressing, bowel and or bladder care, routine bed baths, menstrual care, ambulation, transfer, bathing, oral hygiene, aka toothbrushing and flossing, and grooming, rubbing skin and repositioning, care and assistance with prosthetics and medication, heavy cleaning, not light cleaning, heavy cleaning, care and assistance with, I'm sorry, I said that already, accompaniment to medical appointments, accompaniment to alternative resources, yard hazard abatement, removal of ice and snow, oh, to have that problem, <laughs> where I am, uh, protective supervision, paramedical services, and teaching and demonstration. So those are the kind of services that are allowed. And then the question is, where is an IHSS provider authorized to provide services? So big clue, <laughs> in-home tends to give away sort of most of the game here. Um, so in the home is a, usually a key feature. There is an option of accompaniment to appointments or alternative services, but helping a consumer get to and from alternative resources where the IHSS recipient would receive services that are not IHSS. Um, this is a pretty unusual kind of service to actually receive. And um, really it goes transportation, they're there safely, you're done. There is no authorization for any sort of waiting time there. And same goes for accompaniment to medical appointments, helping the person to get to and from the doctor, dentist, other kind of healthcare, health-related appointment, that's fine. But sitting around the waiting room, not allowed. So it's a, it's a very discreet and, and relatively, the accompaniment to medical appointments is not so rare. But again, just keeping in mind, not the waiting part. And of course, as we know, that's maybe where we spend a lot of time. So I did wanna mention what can't an IHSS provider do? So besides waiting, standing around and waiting. Um, there is, I think, particularly around the issue of protective supervision, some kind of difficult gray areas, just because protective supervision, you're pretty much waiting, <laughs> you, you know, you need to be poised to keep the person safe at all times. And what the person is choosing to do is mostly their life. Um, so that that is a little, you really have to have a sense of, being vigilant, uh, looking for a provider who can be vigilant and really be active even when um, the participant or the consumer is engaged in kind of those regular activities. But some things that an IHSS provider shouldn't really be doing is caring for pets, even if they're service animals, even if they're an emotional support animal. Um, they probably should not be gardening, except as specified before, like if you're in a wildfire area and you need to keep a protective distance, a protective space, defensible space, that's okay, but other kinds of gardening is not. Um, repair services, paying bills, nope. Um, watching TV, having, you know, like just kind of having a conversation. Those are, those are technically not on the list of approved services. And again, one more time around the bend, waiting for appointments, waiting is just not on the list of approved um, services. Go ahead, Mary Ellen. I was just gonna ask if you wanted to address questions oh, at this have... point in time or afterwards, there's some very good questions in chat. One that popped up is um, a suggestion that at medical appointments, it would be helpful to help the person understand what's happening and we totally agree that would be lovely, but they're not covering that in IHSS. So 
try to think of in-home support services as one of a cluster of services that you can kind of piece together to make a whole, you know, meaningful day for someone. Um, for adults who live in the community, typically they would have either a supported living or an independent living staff person that hopefully could meet them at that appointment and explain what's going on. Uh, it's not the role of the IHSS provider to, to serve in that capacity. And CalABLE does not count against you when they're counting your resources. That was another question. Sorry, Maura. I just no, thought. No, thank you. No, I, good I, question, I appreciate time to, Yeah. No, and I, and I think that you really, ra that raises that issue of, you know, it, what is the role of the in-home supportive service provider and the provider's responsibility is safety and support, but it really shouldn't supplant the role of loved ones and other kinds of support persons. So just because you hire someone to do IHSS doesn't mean that you necessarily want to have them hear all of your HIPAA protected <laughs> healthcare information. I mean, yes, right. providing a personal service, but maybe not directly involved in making you know, healthcare decisions or supported decision making. So just, um, I really appreciate that clarification. Um, we're now at probably the elephant in the room, which is how do I, in this economy, in this area, <laughs> how do I find an in-home supportive service provider? There are several sources, and this question is really written from the perspective of a self-advocate, a person who needs that support for themselves to live their a self-determined life. Um, so several sources, family members, um, often uh, family, extended family, um, sometimes neighbors, those kinds of, you know, inner circle. Um, sometimes it's the person's representative. So in my case, I was a parent of a person who was eligible for IHSS. And so when I have five kids under a certain amount, I really needed extra hands on deck. I was not looking to be the provider. I was looking to have assistance. And so really my role as the parent also then became sort of an HR, <laughs> like recruiting, hiring, supervising, training, um, staffing, staffing for those hours um, for two youngsters. So that is another source. And of course, that means the representative circle of um, supports and contacts. And then there is the public authority. And when I say the public authority, I'm thinking um, the county offers a, like they maintain a list of IHSS providers who were at least what at, at one time willing to work for additional IHSS recipients. So sometimes you can, you can contact the public authority and say, I'm looking for a person. They can send you a list. You can work your way down the list as a source of other potential folks. So um, I do wanna also on this slide address, when can a parent serve as the IHSS provider? And this is particular for minors, again, children under 18. IHSS can pay a parent or a family member to help with the services required, but to be a parent provider, the following have to be true. So first, the parent must have either quit full-time employment or be prevented from working full-time because of the person with a disability's um, need for care. And there cannot be another provider available, like readily waiting to, to like just waiting to work. <laughs> um, and if the services are not received, Ultimately, this child would be at risk of an out-of-home placement or receiving inadequate care. So those are, those are the standards that they apply to a parent serving as a provider for their um, child who is a recipient. I do also want to mention that respite services from the regional center, like people sometimes kind of like, think, oh, if I tell the regional center I'm getting IHSS, they're going to take away my respite. Or <laughs> like, like there's a lot of like worry about sharing what resources and generic resources that we're um, obtaining from other sources. And as Mary Ellen said right at the beginning, regional center's expectation is that if you are eligible for IHSS, you are applying for IHSS. That regional center is there to 
kind of backfill of the other needs, but that we're really maximizing every consumer's access to services to which they are entitled. So um, a, a child, for example, should be able to receive in-home supportive services, even protective supervision, which tends to be a lot of hours, without forfeiting respite. Those are two different purposes. Respite to, for the parent to get a break from the care. IHSS is to keep the child in the home by providing those supports, the safety, and whatever services have been determined. Um, additionally, the hours that are authorized by a waiver for home nursing care, for example, also should not count against in-home supportive service hours. So those are just something to keep in mind, like from if you happen upon a service provider who seems to be like judgy, that's not the way this is supposed to work. Respite is a completely different service. So be protective of it. And I'm going to I believe I have one more. What if I'm unhappy with a provider? So parent to parent, I would love you to trust your gut. Um, these services are supposed to be helpful. And again, whether you are a person with a disability who is hiring for your own care, or whether you are a parent looking for care for a loved one, um, yes, it can be difficult to recruit, to train, to supervise. And that is no reason to tolerate inappropriate, unreliable, or uncomfortable treatment. So really, like having those really, I put healthy boundaries, it's so important. Like if, if you start, they always talk about schools, like the teacher that sets the, you know, that has like the really hard line that they tend to get the most out of students because then they can relax. It's really hard to start loosey-goosey and then all of a sudden change the rules to be more strict. So um, really healthy boundaries, like, it's your obligation as either a representative or as the recipient to really, you have to certify that timesheet. So no, like no rounding up, no exaggeration, like that is what, that's the rules. Um, communication, being comfortable in your own home, like all of those things are so important. And obviously any sign of any sort of abuse or inappropriate, impropriety. Um, there are a number of places that you can contact. So this is why I'm going to put a plug in for like making thoughtful hires, that we don't just take the first person who applies just because we're desperate for help, that we really do screen applicants, that we meet in person. And if, if I'm feeling like stressed, or if I'm a person that's hiring someone for the first time to care for me, this is another time. Invite a friend, invite a loved one over to help you with the interview and to get their opinion too. Like maybe, do you get the same vibe um, during that interview? And then most importantly, check the references. It takes just a few minutes to validate that the person has cared successfully um, for others. Um, and so really do, if you've taken references and asked for them, go ahead and follow through with that. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ellen. Thank you, Maura. Uh, just to piggyback on that real quick, we might have wanted to start off with letting you know the maximum amount of hours you can get for IHSS is 283 hours a month. So clearly that's not going to meet all of anyone's needs if you need round the clock care. Uh, so it's, you know, sometimes prudent to hire more than one provider because you need backup. You know, the more people that know your situation, know how to care for your child or yourself, the better off you are. Um, I would also suggest sitting down before you begin the working relationship. And you don't have to make a formal contract, but there are some forms that you can um, establish, you know, guidelines with your provider. Um, because sometimes people are unhappy with their provider for unreasonable requests. So factoring being reasonable in is very important. Um, I had one gentleman that I used to support who had a fabulous couple that provided so much of his day-to-day -day support. 
And he was irate when the gentleman would not come down at one in the morning because he wanted to go out for New Year's Eve. And the provider lived in an area where he did not feel safe. They shoot off guns at night. Um, he said no. And the gentleman threatened to fire him, which, you know, we really had to sit down and have a little heart to heart that losing that individual would have really jeopardized his living situation because this was a gentleman who needed 24 hour care. Um, so just kind of be reasonable with the person and set some guidelines and hopefully it can be a two way street. So sorry, Maury, I didn't uh, mean to go on about that. But yeah, if you can hire more than one and think about your circle, who do you know at church? Who do you know from school? Who have you heard might need some extra income? Um, who's a neighbor that might be able to fill in the early morning spots. You know, you really kind of have to think about your network. So if you disagree with that eligibility determination, you do have a path to recourse. So the notice of action lists all those authorized hours that Maura was identifying earlier. So on the back of that form, there's information on how to request a fair hearing. This should also be in your preferred language. So obviously you wanna to try to resolve the matter at the lowest level possible. And, so, and you can just request a reassessment. Um, you can also request that a supervisor come in addition to the person doing the assessment because it could be somebody new who's very, you know, by the book and just didn't see what someone else with a little more experience might see. That might not be possible because everyone right now is struggling to get staff and IHSS may be among those uh, agencies that are struggling. But as for a reassessment, you can do a fair hearing, which if any of you have had a fair hearing for any regional center issues, educational issues, Medi-Cal, any social service program, you know that it's you have 90 days to request that hearing. You can request aid paid pending. So if, if you get a notice of action saying, we're gonna terminate your services, and you disagree with that, you file for aid paid pending, which keeps your services in place until you have the opportunity to have that fair hearing. Uh, no time limit if adequate notice was not given, including no notice at all, which doesn't usually happen. But it's always good to write a short, clear letter stating what the issue is and the grounds for relief. Um, a fair hearing consists of an administrative law judge coming in and sitting down to really hear both sides and why the determination was made and why you disagree with that determination. So the case is assigned to what they call a county appeals worker. And this is the job of that worker. So this is before you go to a fair hearing. They represent the county. If you have not had any success with your reassessment and just talking it through. So it's, again, always really important to try to work with the person that can help you out. So they, the, the people that are appeals workers know the regulations. They know how to be a little more flexible. They know how to, to educate and inform a new worker that maybe was just being overly zealous and trying to show that they were going to hold the line and keep the hours to a minimum. Um, and they can help you get the information that you need. It's not to say it always goes in your favor, but generally there is some flexibility. And if you can really make your case, and again, like Morris said, and it's a genius idea, have videos, have some pictures. You know, your child, when the worker came out originally, might be on their best behavior that day. Other days, morning might just set them off. You might have served a breakfast that was not appealing to them you're now wearing it. You know, you just really need to explain how long it might take to put those shoes on if the child doesn't want those shoes that day. Um, you know, so just kind of a little dialogue is really important. So, where are we? So if you disagree, and this appeal still hasn't worked, then you can go to the next slide, the administrative hearing. This is where the administrative law judge comes in. These are not 
robes and courthouses. These are rooms that you go to with someone in a suit. Now they will have a tape recorder there. They, you know, will be organized as hopefully you will. The witnesses are under oath. So if you want to bring in a parent, a grandparent who helps you out that can say, oh yeah, you don't know the half of it, you know, to just really support your case. Um, the hearing is recorded, as I mentioned, so that the judge can go back and go through what the testimony was. Oftentimes these judges have to go back and look through the regulations for themselves because these could be judges that not only do IHSS hearings, they could do regional center hearings. So it's good to have that on record. And again, don't feel like you can't bring support people because you can. So the formal rules of evidence do not apply. So this means that hearsay is admissible and that documents do not have to be authenticated. So by hearsay, it could, it could be a neighbor saying, oh my Lord, you know, I see this child out banging his head on the, on the driveway every morning because they hate getting on the bus. It can just be those kinds of observations that you failed to, you know, think were important or you just didn't even think about it. Have those people come in. They represent your child. Um, the judge will, of course, weigh the evidence based on their determination of whether or not this person is reliable and only relevant evidence should be presented. So don't drag up things from four years before. You want to talk about the current situation. So to prepare for the hearing, understand the issues. Why do you think, and if you've had a reassessment, you will by then know why the person said no. You're not going to get any paramedical services because they are not just given out like candy. So what you... And again, Maura pointed out there's a lot of resources. So you can do your homework and you try to find out what, what is the law that applies to the case. Have a checklist, manuals, memos, other information you can refer to. Have websites that you can go to, which we're going, going to give you. And outline the points you want to make. And again, make sure your witnesses, especially if they're a family member, not to exaggerate, just to state the facts because typically the facts are enough. So you wanna organize your presentation, be simple, logical, straightforward. Don't be overly dramatic. No, you know, tears, if they come, they come, but you know, we're not putting on a show. You just wanna explain why you need this service. Um, and you explain why you need the particular number of hours. And quite honestly, oftentimes you, you're, you're gonna be very honest in saying, if you gave me the maximum amount of hours, it still isn't enough because that's truthful. It's not, but it helps. So you get the evidence you need beforehand. You go to your doctors, you get the diagnosis, functional limitations, um, what that doctor's recommendations would be, what, what the doctor sees in the future for your child. Uh, declarations of witnesses who can't attend the hearing. So teachers are a great source of information. They observe your child hopefully, now that everybody's back in school, five days a week. Um, they may not be able to attend a hearing, but they can write up a little description for the judge and prepare the exhibits in the order you plan to present them. Um, yeah, the declaration of witnesses is, is very helpful. So the administrative law judge has to issue a written decision stating the issues, summarizing the facts, and, the find and with findings of facts and conclusions of law. So he'll explain what he heard, what the facts are, and what he decided. So the county has to implement any portion of the decision that is favorable to you. The decision can be appealed to the superior court within one year. So if, the, if this does not go in your favor, you can appeal to the Superior Court of California. Or you can request a rehearing, but a rehearing request is not required for appeal to a superior court. And we did uh, have one gentleman who had to go through three hearings before his um, hours were approved to the level that he needed. So if you're unhappy with your caseworker, there's several things you can do. You can always call the supervisor for help. You can call the deputy director and ask to file a case complaint. The deputy should review your file and respond to your request. 
or you can call the ombudsperson for assistance. So there are other individuals that you can, even if you want to just run by what you're thinking or what you're feeling, if you just get an uncomfortable feeling like that person seemed to have it in for me, you know, is this typical? You can just ask those questions. That's perfectly acceptable. So you do want to get any assistance and information that you can. So that is that special I, topics. It is special topics. Um, I did want to address. There's a couple. There was a question in the chat. I saw a hand up and then oh. down. Um, for I'm he, seeing that people are really interested in getting a copy of the recording. Typically, it takes us at least four hours to process and get it back. However, I want to. I see a couple of people have like time sensitive IHSS issues. I'm and get you email address, contact information. Maury, your internet's kind of going out. No. Is it okay now? Yes. Okay. I'm screen sharing, I'm doing it all, and I'm unstable. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, am I okay now? So yeah. what I was just saying is that we will get the playback posted as quickly as we can. I cannot guarantee that it'll be tomorrow. Um, and I'm inviting you to hang on, at, be, like try to stay on after, um, or I'll put my email in the chat. It's also on the last slide um, that you can reach out to me and I'll make sure and try to get information to you faster if you have a time sensitive issue. Otherwise it gets posted on our YouTube channel. Um, which is Exceptional Family Resource Center on YouTube. And um, some of your questions, you might find the answer on the Disability Rights California website as well. Which is in our resources. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, so now we're in, and I, I know there's some other topics, and I just want to remember or remind folks that we are going to do Q&A at the end because um, I do want to make sure and try to get through the bulk of our presentation in that first hour. Um, so special topics, paramedical services, these require authorization and training by a medical professional before they can be provided. And so some of the examples are administering medication, giving injections, you see them blood urine testing, wound care, catheter care, ostomy, irrigation, treatments that require sterile procedures, enemas, digital stimulation, insertion of suppositories, tube feeding, suctioning. Those are the biggies. Um, it's important that you let your provider know what will be expected. They need training. I'm just going to say that training, 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 training. And it is very important that they do not perform any of those paramedical services until they have been trained. That's like the most important piece. Um, now we're at protective supervision and I saw there was a question in the chat. So hopefully this section we will help to clarify. And if it doesn't, then we'll circle back at the end. Um, and we have a number of resources um, in a few slides that specifically deal with protective supervision, both for children um, or minors, as we call them, or um, adults. So as I was talking about a 24 seven care plan, once approved for protective supervision, which I know I'm kind of putting the cart before the horse, but I wanna make the point, um, it needs to be created by the recipient and or their representative, and it needs to document who is gonna be responsible for protective supervision at all times. So Mary Ellen talked about 283 hours. Meh, I've seen hours that are more like 160, 168. Like there's a variety of hours that you could get and it still count as protective supervision. And like Mary Ellen said, doesn't count 24 seven. So there's still going to be other people involved in providing for the safety and supervision of the individual. Um, so basically what people often reach out and say, what do I put in the 24 seven plan? And I'm like, the truth. <laughs> so you're basically gonna detail, basically I usually just do a week and talk about what is that the life of the recipient look like? And so that would be when they're in school, they get on the bus at this time, they come home at this time. Between those hours, the school has them. And if they have a uh, one-to-one aid or supplemental support, that's another key indicator that they probably need a lot of support. Um, you can also talk about 
other programs, therapies, community access. I used to put like my child goes to church with, uh, with our family for this hour or this hour and a half. Natural supports, if you have family in the area, if you're lucky enough to have a grandparent nearby or a cousin or an aunt, if they're helping you, those are all things that you can put into the 24 seven care plan. And again, the main reason that they ask you to do this or require you to do this is really to make sure that you as the primary person trying to support an individual, that we're really thinking if something happened to you, this is the plan they're gonna look to, to help to cobble together something um, until you can be back, um, you know, kind of running the show again. So thinking about who's knowledgeable for, about your loved one, familiar to your loved one or to the recipient um, who could assist. So that's kind of my 24 seven care plan. But protective supervision is really consisting of observing behavior and then being able to intervene to safeguard the recipient. It isn't going to be to prevent all behavior from happening, but it's merely injury, hazard, or accident. Um, they will look to see about non-self-directing behavior. That means that the person might appear to be aimless, con confused, perhaps have an impairment. Um, at the time we, of the assessment or the reassessment, because this is one that they don't just let like linger, they do expect an ongoing redetermination annually, um, the need to have that 24 hour a day supervision in order again to remain safely in their home. And I should, I should make that clear, in the home of their choosing um, for adult. And so it is with that combination, like I talked about the care plan, they're gonna look for what more hours are needed to provide um, a reasonable amount of safety. So next, and I think someone asked, is it a separate application? No, but it is helpful to kind of go in going, I'm also asking to be considered. I need my loved one to be considered for protective supervision. Typically, if there's some significant behaviors or behavioral profile, that should be the <laughs> like the flashing light for the caseworker. But I don't um, recommend that you leave that to chance. I, I come in saying I would like to be considered for all the services that my um, loved one is eligible to receive. So. Um, kind of the what is protective supervision not? <laughs> so what will not be authorized? And this is to be social. <laughs> That's not protective supervision. Um, when a need is caused by a medical condition and the form of supervision that is required is medical in nature, that's also not protective supervision. And again, we're drawing really fine lines like that are sometimes very hard. Like as parents, we're like, what's the difference? There's a difference in who's paying, who's responsible, what is the purpose. Um, in anticipation of a medical emergency, so as someone who has a loved one with lots of neurological issues, including seizures, it's really hard to go, what do you mean protective supervision isn't for if they drop to the ground and have a seizure, that not that getting hurt? No, it's it, it really has to go back to the ability to be self-directed, the ability to be in control, to make like appropriate calculations about safety risk, those kinds of issues. Um, do they know if they run in the street that it's a very bad thing? Do they, you know, understand all of the consequences of behavior? And if the answer is no, then that's a conversation to have. Um, to prevent or control aggressive or antisocial behavior. This is another one that protective supervision is not there to prevent. Um, aggressive behavior, it's to protect the person with the disability, not to protect everyone else in the environment, which is another really hard one for families sometimes to um, kind of rationalize. It's also not to guard against deliberate self-destructive behavior such as suicide um, or when the individual, sorry, there's a typo, knowingly intends to harm himself or herself. The question we get, can young children qualify for protective supervision? Answer in red, yes, C. 
Um, so a county worker should always assess an IHSS eligible minor, again, child, for mental functioning. Um, again, though it says so, <laughs> so it, there's a citation with a section, uh, don't count on it. It's, it's I, again, if that's something that you are hoping to receive, it's helpful to make that request, <laughs> to verbalize that request. Um, so the following steps are taken when assessing a child's mental functioning. And so they should be assessing all eligible children for a mental impairment. They should be looking whether there's documentation of a mental impairment. That could look like an IEP assessment. Often for children, that's a helpful um, resource to bring in. If your child has had an evaluation, again, for like supplemental support or a special circumstances instructional assistant, where it's really looking at activities of daily living, behavior, um, other medical needs, like it really lines up all the kinds of supports that might be needed. Those are helpful documents to have. They should be reviewing a minor's mental functioning on an individualized basis, and they should not presume it says a functional score of one. You're like, what's one? One means fully independent. So they should not presume independence. They need to ask. They need to elicit that information from the caregiver or from the person with a disability. Um, they also need to determine whether they need more supervision because of the mental impairment than does a minor of the same age without such an impairment. A minor must not, that means must not, shall not, be denied protective supervision because a parent leaves the child alone for some fixed period of time, like five minutes. You in your interview, parent to parent, <laughs> you in the interview do not need to pretend that you've never showered alone. Like you can admit that I have to take a shower to be a person, like, or I have to go use the restroom sometimes. And yes, stuff happens when I'm in the bathroom, not the stuff I'm doing, the stuff that's happening outside. And, and that is okay. You don't need to worry that like, oh my gosh, you're not gonna get protective supervision because you can leave your child alone for five minutes. I mean, you're gonna have some probably information about what happens when that has to happen, but, that is not a reason to deny protective supervision. Um, the social worker does need to evaluate functions of memory, orientation, and judgment. And they should review the information provided by the family member, and they are not required to obtain the information or documentation. So it's up to you upon request to provide. So if you are asked for something, it's a big signal that you need to provide that documentation. It will not be up to that IHSS social worker. If you don't provide the IEP assessment, let's say they say, could you provide you know, documentation that your child has um, been assessed as having an intellectual disability? Go get the form, get it to them. They're not going to go to the school and ask for it. You need to be that, per that linkage. Um, we are on teaching and demonstration, and I'm going to kind of breeze through this only because this is a very short-term service. It cannot go longer than three months, and the purpose is usually for adults to help teach a service, to teach and demonstrate um, how to do some self-care or some household tasks, and the expectation is that they're gonna learn it and then IHSS can discontinue that amount of hours that would be on that line. So something to keep in mind is that it's a short-term service and that because the goal is to be short-term, it goes away. So if you don't learn the service in three months, you might need to go back and say, still don't know the service or still cannot provide it to myself. Um, and then last, in my little pile of goodness. Um, electronic visit verification. We are so timely that we are talking about something that just went into effect 10 days ago, although they've been talking about it for a while. Um, so beginning July 1st, it is a federal requirement that IHSS providers who do not live at the same residence with the recipient need to check out, check in, 
note, like, I don't know if it's GPS or how it's all working exactly because I'm live-in, <laughs> um, so it's not changing things for live-in providers, but there are no penalties right now for having to correct, um, whether you're in the home or the community. Um, but again, the big takeaway for this is just that we have a responsibility if you are a representative or a recipient to comply with this EVV um, and to be, you know, again, honest and certifying those timesheets. If you have any questions um, at the end, I'll put in the chat. Um, there's an email and then there's also a help desk. And I think we're at Mary Ellen. Oh, thank you, Maura. So resources and links. For those of you who need this information urgently, I would go to the IHSS information down here from Disability Rights California. They have an excellent guide. All of these are really good pieces of information, but it's very succinct and it's very um, easy to identify the question that you're that you need an answer to on the disability rights website. That's my personal opinion. All of these things are really helpful though, because it's like so many of our systems, it's just another kind of a forest to you know go through. You have to get the lay of the land. You have to understand what the rules are, um, but it it's so beneficial when you get it. It really can just make such a difference in your life. Don't be intimidated by anything that we've said. And don't feel as though if something changes, you can't request another assessment. <clears throat> Excuse me, people have health issues. No one's life is this nice linear, growing, growing, growing process. We have peaks and valleys. So for someone who's, if you go into the hospital, they do obviously suspend your in-home support service hours, but when you come out, you may need additional hours. So having a good relationship with that caseworker is so important because they're the person that gets to know you and really can understand your situation. So when you need you know, a few more hours here or there, it's really good to have a great relationship with that individual. Um, I don't know, the self-assessment, Oh, I was going to just um, mention that these, I ended up putting all the Spanish links and English links sorted. So it goes title, English, and then Spanish below it. And then the next title, English, then Spanish, which you can probably tell. Um, there are, I'm going to just chat through this, share of costs. Those of you who are concerned about that, there are links for that kind of information. Authorized tasks, functional ratings so that you can really kind of have an understanding of what to expect at that interview um, and kind of get used to answering one, two, three, four, <laughs> over and over and over during the interview. Um, some information about paramedical services. Um, right now, unfortunately, these are English only links. Um, there's information on uh, protective supervision for minors and for adults. Disability rights also has a pretty nice uh, assessment criteria worksheet where you can kind of do a self-assessment and kind of get a sense of what you should be offered. Um, it's in English, but sorry, I'm not in charge of the world. Um, and then there is a brochure on institutional deeming. Um, just if you do have a question and have never encountered that concept and your loved one does not have Medi-Cal, I encourage you to like look into that if you're, uh, loved one is a regional center consumer. And then these are both web pages that can be translated. Um, I did want to just <laughs> make a couple more comments, sorry. In the resources and links, we're still training. Um, Self-certification of live-in providers. And Mary Ellen was like, I'm not touching it. I'm like, I will, I will <laughs> into the breach. Um, so when you reside at the same address as the recipient, your IHSS wages as the provider may be excluded from your gross income for purposes of state and federal income tax. This went into effect a few years ago. Um, and so it's something to, to know if, especially if you are a parent or a sibling of a person who is an IHSS recipient, 
um, just something to know. And then steps to become an IHSS provider. Um, if this is all kind of new to you, um, there is a pretty, <sighs> pretty structured process and I'm going to say to you it is not the fastest process ever um, you are required to attend an IHSS provider orientation that's given by the county and you will learn important information um, you will have to complete and sign both a provider enrollment form as well as a provider en um, enrollment agreement can't be one form, it has to be two. And then you also need to get fingerprinted and go through a criminal background check by the California Department of Justice. These are non-negotiable. Even if you are a parent, you are going through those same things. The nice thing is that they can, like when you start the orientation process and you're approved, like there's, there's a little bit of retroactivity that can go on. But um, something to keep in mind is that it does, at least when I was going through, last I knew, um, the onus on paying for that background check and uh, fingerprinting is on the provider. So, which it's not awesome. So I didn't mean to end on a sad note. Mary Ellen. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Maura. Those are all great <laughs> resources. Um, yeah, because again, we are a very resource rich community if you know about the resources. So now you know, consider yourselves informed. Um, and yeah, the tax thing did change a few years ago, thank the Lord, because, you know, um, they have unionized IHSS workers and the pay has increased, you know, substantially from what it used to be. Um, so that's a good thing because there's such a need and it's just a growing need because it's not just people with disabilities that receive in-home support services, it's seniors as well. So it's a huge area that uh, really needs addressing. Maura, I did notice in the chat, someone asked about, you know, the um, services that require training. So could you- um, Are you talking about the paramedical? Was that specific? Well, yes, <laughs> oh, yeah. Where do people obtain that training? Because I know we used to hire a nurse to train our staff if they were doing those procedures or injections or anything of that nature. But where does the parent- You know what, I am going to make a note to find out where else training can occur. I think that, you know, for some it's a licensure that they are a certain um, level of expert who are providing those paramedical services, but um, I'm happy to, to kind oh, of make sure we have some yeah. resources. You know, I didn't even think about it. I mean, because we hired a nurse to do that because there just weren't resources. I was right. hoping you'd say, oh yeah, that was the oh, dark ages. No, I, w I wish that <laughs> I, I wish I knew who was doing training and where that, what that process is. I think there is definitely uh, information available and I will track that down. And if there isn't, there might be some organizations that have nurses on staff that might be willing to do that training we could maybe talk about trying to coordinate with some of them to set that up to have that available you know i'm thinking like home of guiding hands or somewhere where they they utilize nurses on a regular basis can't hurt to ask and i'm gonna ask if we're gonna open it up to question and answer I'm going to stop the share and I'm also going to, if everybody's gotten that information off the screen, there we are. And I want to be able to, I'm seeing an, an acronym and I have to say that I didn't, I think WCPS, go ahead, I'm looking up an answer. Okay, which one? A waiver for personal care services, I think, was one of the questions. Oh. And that is, where are we? Sorry, I'm trying to scroll at the same time. Right. Okay, I see for paramedical, has to be a nurse or can it be the parent? I believe it's the training component that's the critical piece. Um, and again, we'll get some information. And then it says WPCS. Sorry. 
is oh, for okay. medical. What is the form? Um, and I'm not sure that I understand the question for that. Is, looking. is the question, where do you get that form? Or where do you get the waiver? The waiver, I know the waiver comes from the department. I believe it's healthcare services. Probably. Is that from right? Yeah. And we didn't even touch on nursing waiver services, which can provide additional hours. The topic of IHSS is so big. We wanted to is. be able to give people like sort of that, that starting point. It's um, huge. So I will take that and get more information. Well, and I hate to tease people with nursing, additional nursing services because uh, getting providers is next to impossible right now. Oh, thank you. I see. Somebody told you that a waiver of personal care services for more hours. 